Hello everyone, Prompt here, back again with another video for Nano Rooms. I'm going to be starting a new series on biology, chemistry, and math. And no matter how different they are, I want to use this series to tell you that, hey, they're actually all the faces of the same coin. And of course, as a recent first year of UBC, I'd like to take this opportunity to help out. This series is designed to be a sort of companion to Chem 121, Bio 112, and Math 102. Sometimes, when you're stuck on trying to understand something, I find that it's really nice to take a step back and take a look at the bigger picture of what you're trying to learn, why it's significant, and find a little more joy learning it. But, of course, if you're a new returning viewer from elsewhere, you're going to be in for a ride as well, don't worry. But before we begin, make sure you all like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Show some support. It's all free, of course. So without further ado, please join me in this new series, How to Build an Organism, Episode 1, The Logic Behind Biology. So to start off, let's outline a map of what we're going to do. First, We'll go over logic and decision making. Next, we'll try to wrap our head around why this logic is even needed in biology. Then we'll take a look at what makes up that logic and finish up with a beautiful and simple example. But our story starts more simply. Just you clumsily cooking in your dorm next to a fire alarm. You start cooking, and you suddenly realize that you weren't paying attention, and you suddenly realize after that that smoke starts rising from the pan, and suddenly you have started a fire, and the alarm goes berserk. You and your overly observant roommate decides to take a peek, and even made, and even made notes on how the fire alarm turned on, and it's pretty obvious. The alarm only turns on when there's both fire and smoke, as you can see here. He even said that we should go ahead and go complain to dorm administration that the alarm should actually turn on either when there's fire or when there's smoke. So now, we've got two different kinds of decisions being made here. One, where both the input 1 and 2 are required, or when either 1 or 2 are required. These two types of decisions are called AND and OR logic. But you don't need a table like this, called a truth table, to represent them every single time. You can represent them like this, more abstractly. Two legs on the left represent the input, and two legs, and the legs going out represent the output, as you can see here. And of course, there's nothing special about the fire alarms here. You can ha have this sort of system behind any sort of electronics. That's why we draw them abstractly, instead of using big, clunky tables. I'd also like to add that there is another type of gate out there, and that is called the NOT gate, which as the name suggests, makes the output the opposite of the input. You can combine these three types of gates in all sorts of combinations to build all sorts of things. Things including, but not limited to, adding binary numbers, the most basic form of fast memory, all the way up to the devices you are viewing this video on right now. However, something more peculiar stands. These logic circuits aren't only found inside of computers and electronics but they are found in every single living thing as well. 
So now, why do they need them? Why do living things need these things? So now, imagine yourself as a bacteria. You have lots of different types of foods you can choose from, all sorts of various molecules. Which one would you choose? What sort of criteria would be in your best interest if you're one of these guys? Go ahead, take a step back and think about it. Write your answers in the comments if you want. It'd be nice to start a discussion. And the answer is actually quite simple. They would definitely consume the food that takes the least effort to consume and gain them the most energy. So now let's simplify our case a bit. Before waiting for me to say the answer, which type of sugar do you think takes the least effort and rewards the most energy? And hold on to that thought. So many of you may already know that lactose, the one that's on the upper side, needs to be broken down in two before it can be consumed. And that process isn't the most efficient of all time. So cells would have to make lactase, or formerly known as beta-galactosidase, to break down the lactose. And if you think about it, this actually wastes a good bit of energy trying to make that enzyme. It's still a gain, but still it would be much, much better to just directly consume glucose. So now, let's make a truth table, just like the case of the fire alarms earlier. If we have neither, we don't make lactase. It's a waste of energy. If we only have lactose, we do make lactase because that's the only thing present. When there's only glucose, we just directly consume the glucose. And neither do we make it when there's both. It's much better to leave the lactose lying around and consume all the glucose first. So now you can see, just something as simple as picking between two types of sugars requires bacteria to use logic to make decisions. The question now is how? How do they make decisions? What sort of components are behind the scenes? What sort of gears and cogs are behind the scenes of this? So let's start out with the most basic components of biology, DNA. As you know, DNA is just basically the equivalent of source codes inside of computers. These codes are used to perform tasks such as running a program or telling your printer to print out stuff, essentially to perform some sort of function. Cells too use DNA to perform some sort of function, say dividing cells defending from viruses, and turning on or off some features to survive extreme temperatures. The gears behind most of these functions usually involves a type of molecule called proteins. Yes, it's the same one that's in your muscles. For instance, the act of breaking lactose that we've discussed earlier requires the protein lactase. The instructions to build the proteins are encoded in the DNA. So now the question remains, how do we convert this blueprint of DNA into actual proteins? First off, the DNA gets transcribed into a little string that contains a copy of code called RNA. That copy then gets translated into amino acids. Um, to put it simply, they're like the Lego bricks for building proteins. Then that string of amino acids that we just built folds itself, wraps itself around to turn into proteins. This flow of information from DNA to RNA and RNA to protein is so fundamental 
to every living thing that it has its special name, the central dogma of molecular biology. So now, now that we know how the program flows, let's take a look at the syntax of the program, essentially the grammar behind the DNA. We're going to be focusing on the process of transcription for the most part, making RNA from DNA into code, just to remind you. The protein, the workhorse responsible for this is RNA polymerase. Basically, it makes copies from DNA into RNA. And the RNA that it just made will just be made, will just be transcribed into proteins. However, there is a problem, as you can see. There's nothing that tells the RNA polymerase where it should land. It's like having an airport with no runways. So there should be a sequence that tells it, hey, land on me so you can start transcription. And in biology lingo, that is called a promoter sequence as it promotes transcription. So now, yeah, we can transcribe, but wait, we can't stop. So that's why you also add something called a terminator sequence to, you know, terminate transcription. And now the RNA polymerase can really tell when to start and stop transcription. And in a sense, highlight where our protein blueprint is. But that's not the end of that. We can do even cooler things with our sequence. Let's add something called an operator. And this operator is a landing pad for another protein. And what it does is that it blocks RNA polymerase from even landing. This is what we call repression. And this type of protein is called a repressor. But if you have, say, something like lactose present, the lactose binds to the protein and lifts it off of the sequence. And transcription will just continue as usual. In effect, it's like having a switch. If there's lactose, then transcription is on. But if there's none, then transcription is off. Now, there's something that does the complete opposite to repressors. Certain promoters can be not as good of a landing pad as others. They can be designed to be harder for polymerases to hang on to. And more often than not, these types of promoters will have their polymerases falling right off before they can even transcribe anything. What we can do about it is add something called an enhancer. The thing about this particular one we're working with is that it will only bind when the molecule called cyclic AMP or CAMP, it's similar to the case of lactose, essentially. And when that happens, transcription happens way, way easier, as you can, as you've just seen earlier. The special thing about CAMP is that there's a lot of it when there's not a lot of glucose around. And now we have all the pieces. Let's put them together, shall we? We have two types of switches, one that can detect glucose and one that can detect lactose. This composes the legs for our logic circuit. We also have the output in the form of lactase. And by putting them together this way on the DNA, we now have a logic circuit to help bacteria decide between glucose and lactose. In a more formal manner, this is what we call a lac operon. However, I'm not showing you the full operon, just for those of you who are more technically inclined. Let's see in action, shall we? As you can see, we don't have a lot of glucose, as you can see from the glucose fading there. So when there's not a lot of glucose, there is a lot of CAMP, and that allows the enhancer to bind. However, since there's no lactose, the repressor 
will also bind and block the whole thing from transcribing. Next, when we have no glucose, so it's the same deal. The enhancer binds. However, we do have lactose this time. So the repressor binds the lactose and gets lifted off. And now you can make the lactase. Next up, you have glucose. So no enhancer. Bye bye. And you also have no lactose there. And well, this is probably the worst case ever. The promoter doesn't bind properly and it can't even ram past the lactose. Last but not least, you have both lactose and glucose. So neither repressor nor enhancer is bound, but you still get no transcription since the landing pack is weak and the polymerase will just fall off with uh, not transcribing anything, so therefore no lactase. Phew, well, that's a lot to cover. Before we end this video, let's recap what we've learned. First, we found logic in a really humble place of a dorm kitchen on fire. Then we've extracted observations from said fire alarm escapade and made into logic abstractions. Putting those logic gates together in complex ways, and we've got ourselves a computer. We also find that living things also need logic to make decisions. Such as how it should spend its resources in processing food. And how that particular function requires proteins to process. We then dug deeper and found how proteins are made and how that's so important that it's called the central dogma of molecular biology. Then we started learning the language of DNA and found out the various ways that cells could control transcription. And tied that all up with a neat little example that we begun with in this video. So next time, we'll be getting a little more mathematical here and start learning about how we can take a system that sounds as complicated as genetic circuits and make them into something that's beautiful and neat in mathematics. So anyways, guys, that's the end of the video. That's the end of episode zero. I hope you enjoyed. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell and I'll see you next time.